right, so we're going to uh, start off uh, today's clinic with uh, the LaGuardia Senior Jazz Band. Uh, they've just, as you know, begun school, what is it, about two weeks ago? Began. And they're going to be playing a wonderful arrangement of Francie Boland uh, called Lullaby of the Leaves. Now, Francie Boland uh, co-led a, a jazz orchestra in, starting in the 1960s, which was, in a sense, the equivalent of Thad and Mel, but in Europe. Uh, Francie Bowen, Kenny Clark, big band. And they had some of the greatest saxophone players, sax doublers uh, in the world. And uh, this particular arrangement just features the saxophones. And I'm glad we're starting off with just a straight saxophone section in the, in the sense that the world of doubling, especially in America, began with the saxophone. The saxophone was the key instrument, the foundation, and from that, the clarinet and flute were also part of uh, the saxophone player's responsibility as we get into the 30s and 40s. There were some oboe and bassoon doublers, certainly in the 20s and 30s, but basically, oboe and bassoon doubling really came into its own in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, so when we talk about a doubler, we are first talking about a saxophone player, and I want to make that point um, very clear because what I've seen in the last 20 years is more and more people coming to New York who were trained first as you know, on an orchestral woodwind, whether it be clarinet, flute, oboe, or bassoon, which is fine. But they don't pick up the saxophone until they feel that it will help them get a gig. They don't practice jazz. They don't go down to listen to jazz saxophone players or jazz sax sections. And certainly every Monday night at the Village Vanguard, the Village Vanguard Jazz Orchestra performs and some of the greatest sax players in the world are there every Monday. And that bothers me. And, and I want to make that point very clear. Doubling, woodwind doubling, starts from a saxophone perspective. And I'll talk more about how that helps the orchestral woodwinds when one actually is on the job. So in, in any event, let's go ahead um, and play this. <laughs> Let's set up now, alto in the middle, tenor a little down. Okay, we're gonna just, I'm just gonna count you into your 
um, solely. We're going to do it without the rhythm section first. Okay, one, two. One, two, three. <laughs> So let me tell you why I'm doing this. When we get in the saxophone section, especially in a big band or in a show or a commercial setting, the tendency is for all saxophone players to want to play out and blow, especially if we're also dealing with doubles. When they pick, they write for the saxophone, they generally don't want it to be covered as much, although today on Broadway I can't say that. But the truth is, most good arrangers want the saxophones to be heard for their unique sound. The problem with that is that unless we're playing together every night and with very sensitive players and experienced players, the chance of getting the ultimate blend is not very good. When you play softer, you can hear one another better. You can get a sense of hearing the uh, metal, in a sense, resonate, even if you're playing soft. When you get together to rehearse, which I hope you will do, do you do that? Outside of school. Outside of school. Do you get together? Okay, let's stop right here. <laughs> In my lifetime, the greatest sax section I heard was the original, not the original, the second sort of edition of the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra. Jerome Richards and Jerry Dodgen, Eddie Daniels, at that time Billy Harper, Pepper Adams. Greatest sax section I ever heard. Section. Okay. About a year and a half ago, Jerry Dodgen told me that every Tuesday, Jerome Richardson would call a sectional at his house. In those days, you know, Thad's music was new. It was, you couldn't get it from Ken Dorr Press. It wasn't available online. It was all new. It was coming out, and Thad was writing new stuff. And, and as John Mosca said, Thad Jones' Mel Lewis Band was just an excuse for sax solis. Uh, <laughs> They're fantastic. They're none better. Thad's right, Thad, in my opinion, writes the best sax solis. Francie Bolan wrote a pretty good one here. But those great players, I mean, top of the profession, got together to read and rehearse every Tuesday. This went on for years, as long as Jerome was in the band. So I got to thinking, well, if, if, if the best cats in the world took it upon themselves to do that, well, I should have insisted more in college and, and, and in high school. You should be doing this because it's, you know what it is? I think it's an honor to play in the sax section. And when things are great in the sax section, it, for me, that's one of the highs in music. It, 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 when it's really right, you're playing great music, everybody's geared in, everybody's focused. It doesn't get much better than that as a saxophone player. It really doesn't. You have great music here and you need to take it upon yourselves to get together. So that's just an aside. The best sax section I ever heard in my life did it. We can, okay? Okay, so I want you to feel like all the weight is right in the front of your feet. You can feel your body weight in your feet. Okay, let's do the same thing. Now we'll add the second alto. One, two, one, two, bend. <laughs> play louder and more forceful. So now we're going to play triple piano without the rhythm section. Same thing, triple pan. If you can just play, give them two and four on the hi-hat while I do it. One, two, triple piano. One, two, three. <laughs> Okay, 
Okay. Now, same thing, mezzo piano. One, two, one, two, three. Uh, 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 uh. The horn's in the mouth. You're set already. You can't make an attack on lead alto when the horn's just getting in at the time of the beat. When I'm counting it off, you're set, you're breathing. One, two, breathing. Two, three, four. <laughs> it off your bender, you're in the it's in your mouth and you're breathing. Otherwise there's no chance. It's like you're going up to bat and the guy's already in his delivery and you're just getting set. It's balls by by it. Now we can't all be like the Mets, but alright. One, <laughs> two, one, two, three. The original Francie Bolan, Kenny Clark, big band sax section had one alto, three tenors, and baritone. Derek Humble, fantastic lead alto player. Similarly, the Woody Herman uh, heard what Sam Marowitz was the alto player. Those people knew how to project their sound. It's an art, and it takes a lifetime. Believe me, it's never ending. But one little thing I would say to you, when you're playing lead, put a little more reed in your mouth. Even if you're playing soft, have more wood available. Okay, that may influence your reed choice or the hardness, but for now, put a little more wood in your mouth. Okay, same thing, four take, and then we'll do it with the rhythm. One, two, one, two, three, one. <laughs> before the rhythm enters. When I'm, I'm going to count off four bars. And when I'm counting off four bars, I want you to take your hand like this, put the second finger with these four up against your mouth, wide open your mouth. And you're going to take a breath like this. Sort of like when you hear a plane taking off from the airport, that, you know, the jet sound. So, so it's a lot of disturbance. Open your mouth wide. And you're going to hold that air. And while you're holding the air, then put the horn in your mouth. Okay, so watch. Horn in the mouth, and then we'll play. Okay? Let's do it. Wide open your mouth. Wide open. Ready? Put your horn in the mouth. One, two, one, two, three, four. Instant impression from you guys. Okay. So I'm just touching on things in a very quick way just to point out things about breathing, posture, alignment, the basic stuff. We're going to play now and, and rhythm section just as if we have, you know, 16 pieces there. Okay. So you need to take that breath. Okay. And I'll count two bars after you grab the breath. Two bars after you grab the breath, we're in. So you gotta get the horn in your mouth and set. Ready? No, 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 together. Wide open your mouth. Wide open as long. No, I need to have more, more disturbance. But what this does is the air, the air is split as we're taking it in, and so we get a chance to actually hear our inhalation. Monitoring our inhalation, it's just a trick, but I wanna hear disturbance. Quick, grab it in. Pull it in, quick. Relax, open your mouth. Wide open. Pull it in quick. Put it in your mouth. One, two, three, four.
just took a, a small section in which to focus on. But what we've talked about applies across the board for the entire chart, other musics. Practicing breathing as a section. Do you know that big bands, when they came to New York in the heyday of the swing era, would go to a specific sax teacher, one of them, my old teacher, Joe Allard, uh, another one, Merle Johnson, and they would come as a section to practice breathing together as well as phrasing. Glenn Miller used to have his sax session come to Joe Allard's studio to phrase, and it, whatever you think of the inherent music, the playing, the execution of the Miller band was stellar, and the balance was beautiful. And it's that what I'm talking about. Regardless of what we're playing, we're playing a big band, we're playing a Broadway show, we're playing a woodwind quintet, you know, we're playing uh, with a mixed group of horns behind the singer. It doesn't matter. It's that concept, the attitude of phrasing as a section and starting from a perspective of let's hear each other. So that's when you practice, start what we did here, pianissimo, mezzo piano, mezzo forte, forte. Don't go on to the next one until you really hear each other. Because then when you get to the loud volume, you're hearing stuff that you didn't hear before because you had a chance to hear. If you don't have a chance to hear, you can't hear. And too often today, the volumes in most of our music and symphonic music is so loud that the idea of section playing and, and really grabbing onto one another and becoming a unit, I don't hear it that often. Uh, but you guys can do this. You really can. Bravo. <laughs> Set up one piece of music that fits the range of your instruments. Play eight bars on the sax. Have a metronome going. Have four bars rest. Play eight bars on the flute or eight bars on the clarinet. Go back to the saxophone. Constantly going back and forth, you know, 10 minutes a day, just to get the sense of the differences of the airstream, the column, the finger location, the weight, everything about that, so that it becomes second nature, so that it's not a foreign object in your hands. Because it will feel like that until you, until you play the instruments. But you must study these doubles seriously. Some of our greatest saxophone players were fantastic doublers. I mentioned Frank West, my favorite jazz flute player. And really, a, a, a fl he was a flute major, by the way, as when he got out of the uh, service. Eddie Daniels, fantastic jazz tenor player and probably the greatest jazz clarinet player alive. We can go on and on, I, and on the uh, handouts, I, I made a list of just a select group of not only studio doublers, but jazz doublers. It's really, it helps your musicality, it opens you up to lots of different musics, and uh, it will open up opportunities for you to work as musicians. Okay, so. All right, so the question was, the order in which you can practice the doubles. At the outset, when you're working on flute and developing uh, concepts of flute embouchure, articulation, tongue position, vibrato, the whole thing, I think it's an absolute advantage. It's almost a necessity to start the day with flute uh, before your chops sort of get beat up with other instruments. And whether it's clarinet next or saxophone next, that is not as much of a difference as literally starting with the flute when you're in that process of evolving now, for me, I think the first 10 years that I studied flute seriously, I, I, I felt like if I didn't play flute first, the day was over. I'd have to, you know, hope the moon was in a certain axis and, you know, you know, and I mean, it was literally like, and I would, I was pretty serious about this and I play, practice an awful lot, but if the clarinet, the sax came first for a number of hours, it would always take me a good hour just to get back to a point where I would begin to warm up on a normal day where the flute was first. I, I, would that be that much recovery? In more recent decades, <laughs> especially the last 10 years, I actually find if I play clarinet first, my flute playing is better. I don't know what happened other than old age, but uh, it, I think I know what I need to do with the muscles and they, they recognize where they have to be. But you're, you're teaching your facial muscles as well as the rest of your body, what it has to do when it sees that instrument. It has to be an automatic response. 
so that you don't have to think, okay, bottom lip out, let me drop the corners of the top lip, let me make sure they're away from the teeth, let me make sure the tongue is high or wide. You, know, go, you go through the litany of checkoff things. It's sort of like when I play golf now, which is unfortunate. But uh, I'm standing over the ball, and um, those who play with me know. And sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, okay, relax the hand, slow back, break, you know, back, drop the right elbow, turn the left arm, and, by the, and, and then I hit the shot back. No way I'm hitting the ball. Can't happen. Unfortunately, that's where I'm at. Um, you can't think about every musculature and be successful playing. It has to be an automatic response, and that comes only from quality practice time. Now, who did I just hear say this? Uh, I think it was Phil Smith, the great former first trumpet player of the New York Philharmonic, and that teaches at the University of Georgia. He, did a master class that's online at another Georgia university, which is really good. It's about an hour and a half, but well worth it. And Phil said, perfect practice makes perfect. So it's not just practicing, which I must say I was guilty of for so many years, just putting in the hours and thinking, okay, that's going to take care of it. It's perfect practice. It's really like, what am I doing? For what purpose? What am I concentrating on? If you focus on one thing at a time, you have a better chance of succeeding other than, all right, I'm going to practice my fingers, I'm going to practice my articulation, get my vibrato going. No way that's going to happen. It's not going to happen. I mean, probably 30, 40 years, maybe it'll happen just from osmosis eventually. But to make efficient use of your time in the early stages of flute practicing, have a very specific warm-up, a specific set of exercises that you knew allow you to warm up so your muscles can find themselves. Here's something that everybody tells you to do, and you know, I have to say, I couldn't disagree more. Everybody says, start the day, practice long tones. Practice sustained tones. And I did that, of course, for the first 40 years. <laughs> Until I actually thought for a second, which doesn't happen when you're a student. You think always, oh, I have to do exactly what I was told. No, and I know it's wrong. I know it's 100% wrong now. Because here's the deal. When you're playing a long tone or sustained tone, yes, you're getting a feel for the reed or chops, but what are you really hearing? What are you hearing? What are you hearing when that's happening? One note out of context. One note, but you're also hearing tone. There is no one, even John Faddis, who probably has the greatest ability to pick up a horn and sound great immediately, and that's in spite of himself, uh, that I've ever heard of any wind player. He really does. It's incredible. But we're all not John. So if we're playing a sustained tone a long tone, that's our first sounds we're listening to, there's an automatic critique coming into play. Oh, it's not my best sound. Let me adjust here. Wrong. The first things we should be doing are just simple getting our fingers and air moving without sustaining, without being critical of our tone, because not every day is going to be a good tone day. And if your first note is not a good tone and you start that, it's gone, especially on flute, because then you start maneuvering. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any of you check out my website. I've been doing these videos for the last couple of years, and one that I did was with the great flutist Keith Underwood. And Keith showed me an exercise that was taught to Glenn Gould, greatest pianist who had the most magnificent technique and yet the worst posture. His body was convoluted, his hands rough. And if you listen to the, uh, uh, I mean, any of his recording, Bach, Goldberg variations, either the first or the last one, doesn't matter. It's, it's spectacular. But he learned from a teacher named Alberto Guerra, who taught finger tapping. I, I, how many of you are familiar with finger tapping? I'm, I'm not being facetious either. All right, finger tapping is this. It basically is putting our arm in the most relaxed position possible and examining the fact that our fingers and our arms have a natural buoyancy. So if I, if I just tap my fingernail, it'll come back. I'm not bringing it back, it just comes back. So on the flute, here's how I start the day now. I'm just 
and I'm, what I'm doing is making sure my fingers are relaxed. If I can't do that, if the fingers don't respond, I'm too tight. I'm forcing my fingers to relax. You can do that on the clarinet, saxophone, it doesn't matter. So now I'm just thinking about relaxed fingers and air. I'm not thinking about tone. So... Just... Because it's going to take me a while, for the, especially as a doublet, for the muscles to find themselves. I don't want to play the Moise. You know, yeah, maybe I'll get by it. Now, I wouldn't feel so horrible, but about a half hour later, an hour later, I'll feel it. Because I didn't allow these muscles to find themselves before I'm starting to be critical about the sound. And I don't want to think about the sound. My goal is that I'm going to play at night. The morning is to find the muscles and then work on things. But if I don't find the muscles first, it's shot. It's gone. And as a doubler, we're dead. We have too many embouchures. We have too many sounds. To try to force it upon ourselves, it doesn't work. It has to come gradual like an athlete warming up. I'll share one little anecdote. Again, related to golf. I took a class with the guy who's the chiropractor and head medical guy for the last 12 US Opens, golf. And he shared with me the fact that he said, you see those golfers warming up on the range? Before you see them on the range, they're in the trailers that the USGA brings with all the machinery and, 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 and phys ed people and you know, uh, masseuses. And, Therapist, the whole deal. They're in there for two hours before you see them on the range at 7.38 in the morning. And then when they finish the round, they're back in those trailers lifting weights. That's how much effort they put in. But they're, when they're on the range, they've already warmed their body up. So we have to give ourselves more of a chance and think of ourselves as athletes to warm up and not be so critical in the early hours of our practice on any instrument, on any instrument. The flute is particularly difficult because we don't have the reed and we're just dealing with the lips. We always blame it on the reed, and of course, it, a lot of times it is, but sometimes it's just that we're asking too much too soon. And just to allow the, play a little bit, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, allow the reed, play just scales, simple scales, arpeggios, and no critique of our tone, because tone critique is what ruins us. I know it. I, I've lived it, and I'm pissed that I spent so many years ruining my practice sessions. For what? Because I want to sound like I did maybe the night before. That it's not happening the first hour or two. It's just not. And you'd be surprised how hard the great orchestral players, you'd be surprised how hard they work and how much they practice beforehand. Um, Robert Langevin, the principal flutist of the New York Philharmonic, lives in New Jersey, and Philharmonic rehearsals start at 10. He's leaving his house at 7 in the morning. He wants to be at A.V. Fisher, well, whatever, it's Geffen Hall, at 8 a.m. So he's got his warm-up before he works on stage for the first rehearsal. He told me this. I said, wow, there it is. So this is hard work. No one outside of us understands this. The public will never appreciate it. We do it for ourselves, but if you're going to do it as a doubler, you've got to do it right, and you've got to give your muscles a chance, because we are, basically, we are decathletes. You know, we're, we're doing the decathlon every day, and if we don't let the muscles find themselves early, without judge, judge, being judgmental, not good. When you're switching from saxophone, to clarinet. Let's say you're trained as a classical clarinet player, or you practice that approach, which is, I think, really necessary to do. But when you're switching from a saxophone to a clarinet, if you are using your optimal cl classical setup, which generally means a much closer tip opening, uh, the chances are you're not going to get as much sound. You might squeak, you might overblow because you're used to a larger air column, a larger bore. You're dealing with a conical bore now, you're switching to a cylindrical bore instrument, uh, and there's problems. So 
there's a compensation in the mouthpiece that you would need to use in a commercial or jazz setting. It might need to be a little more open, and I think one can get really accommodate in a good way and still get a really great tone. It's sort of a B45 tip opening and a little closer, not more open than a B45. If you want more open than B45, then you're playing as a soloist with a rhythm section or above a big band. But if you're playing in a section, in a section, you still have to blend pitch, balance, articulation. That sort of a medium opening is good. Basically, as a doubler, on all of your reed instruments, the, co the, the compensation we need to make is that we all need to sort of find a setup that is rather similar across the board, meaning you can't play it like a, you're playing at a saxophone and you have a nine or ten tip opening, let's say, a link nine star, ten. And then you're playing a clarinet with a tip opening of 100. Not a chance you're going to be successful. It can't happen. So you need to sort of groove into the middle of the tip openings and the facings that are available from clarinet and saxophone in a commercial setting. That's not to say if you're a soloist and on a gig, you're playing a clarinet concerto, if you're playing saxophone in a big band and you're the soloist or on a record gig. That's different, but in a section, you've got to make some compensation because the pitch and the balance and the articulation are essential. And too close after saxophone will not be good. What, a way big opening, like, let's say a Pete Fountain opening. He played the largest tip opening. No, I shouldn't say that. Buddy DeFranco played the largest tip opening toward the end of his life. I tried to play it. I could hardly get a sound. It was a saxophone for all intents and purposes. It was that wide open. In this setting, not going to work. So that's one approach I think necessary. Medium strength reads. Not too soft, not, not more A5 equivalents, which is for the older people here. They understand what I'm talking about. Change to flute and piccolo. Flute, piccolo, and alto flute. And now we go in opposite directions. The facial muscles move in opposite directions. Not the way we use our air, not the way we position our tongue, but the way we position our lips. And we go, and this is the biggest problem that people who play single or double reeds get when they then have to move to flute. Uh, and it's a magnificent problem. Uh, it really takes a lot to learn to leave the lips out and leave them away from the teeth. Our whole life, if we're playing clarinet and saxophone, our lips are to our teeth. Now we're being told, go the opposite direction. And without a reed there, now we don't have anything to hold on to. We have to trust that the embouchure and the aperture between the lips is going to direct the air towards that back wall at a good angle that'll allow us at least to get our uh, initial sound to be able to play octaves without too much motion. It's, it's quite a lot to ask. There's no way anyone is going to be a good doubler with flute unless you study that instrument unto itself as an art form. It is not possible. You can play jazz flute, you can play alone with a combo. Yes, talented people could do that. But if you're going to play with other people, if you're going to play quality arrangements, uh, by great writers, you know, writers such as Nelson Riddle, Thad Jones, Don Sebesky, Jonathan Tunick. If you're going to play quality orchestral wind writing, you had better study that instrument seriously and make time every single day. There's no other way. Otherwise, don't, don't even try to do it. It's not worth the time and effort. It's, it, play the lottery or do something easy. Become a lawyer. You know, it, it, it's really... It, you know, what we're attempting to do is a lot harder. And guess what? Let's say you play all these instruments 20, 30 years. Now you stop playing a week or two. You come back. You know what you sound like? Like you just began. So the, the instrument is always our master. I think Dizzy used to say that always. And, and I think he was so right. We can never back off. If, if, if you stop practicing, it's not that others will know. You will know. And that's not a good feeling. So it's a lifelong commitment, and it's hard. So one, two, same place, 17, two, um.
similar to the samba. Same thing, just with just with Paul and the and the flutes. Just so it's a little clear. While this is happening, while you are making the switch, the people who are going to the flutes, they have to constantly move your chops out. So it's not only pushing your chops forward, it's encouraging it because you want the lower lip down. So this is a good motion to make, to encourage the lip down. You've been here, now you have to go opposite. You encourage it by down. So while I'm picking up the flute, if I have two bars, four bars, 16 bars, a minute, I'm constantly working the muscles to re reintroduce them to the shape that I want them to experience, that I know to be right for me, okay? Here we go, right on the, uh, I'll, I'll count one, two, one. One, two, uh. <laughs> tune called Science Fiction, or also known as The Chief. It's three minutes long and involves some of the most severe doubling you can imagine. So even though we're not hearing the whole chart and the beauty of the orchestrations because of the missing instruments, we will see um, these people being pushed to the nth degree, okay? Okay. All right, right at the top. Ready? One, two, one, two, three, come.
and unfortunately there are fewer and fewer gigs where there are real sections today because of economics and um, what the public has been uh, given to get used to. But when we've had more quality uh, music being offered and quality arrangements and large ensembles of acoustic sound, uh, it demanded, and we, of course we had a recording industry that really uh, put the focus on how well you played, how accurate you played, how in tune, uh, how you got along, how you read, all of that. It mattered. And because we don't have a real recording industry today, and even if we did with Pro Tools, anybody can make the sound, you know, anybody can make the uh, sound great, uh, truth be told. But when they did, and you, the red light went off, and you had to produce, and there were only one or two takes going to happen, and then they had to move on to the next project, well, maybe those people didn't go to college, they didn't major in music, they didn't have all the YouTube available of you know, looking out at everything possible, but somehow those players made it happen. And I don't think, because we have more available today, that we should accept a lesser level of doubling. And I, force, I do see that happening, quite frankly. That's just my own opinion. Uh, but hopefully with young players like this who are focused, they will influence other people, and we will keep the level of doubling at least equal to the great players in the 50s and 60s who were fantastic and really set New York as a premier music place.